This is Dr. Ray Henry, and we welcome you to the Moment of Destiny broadcast. Today, we're looking at the greatest decision that you'll ever make in life, grace or works, as concerning your eternal destiny. It's very important, a decision of a lifetime and eternity. So listen very closely. The title of today's message is The Big Choice, Grace or Works. Most of us know the words of that great patriarch, Patrick Henry, as he spoke at the Virginia House of Burgess in March 1775. You know the words, Is life so dear, or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Now that was his fighting words, and, and that was his words at the first uh, Congressional Congress that led to the first revolution, the Revolutionary War. But do you know what his words were at his death? Listen to these words. Some years later, about 25 years later, when he died, June 1799. I have now disposed of all my property to my family. There's one thing more I wish I could give them, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that and I had not anything else to give them, they would be rich. And if they had that not, and I had given them all the world and its riches, they would have been poor. He declared his faith and the importance of the grace of God at his death and his children and grandchildren receive that grace of God in salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Grace is a very, very important part of our theology when we look at salvation and how we're made right with God. Listen to some of these great theologians, some in our day. You all know Max Licato and his book in the grip of grace said this, salvation is God given, God driven, God empowered and God originated. The gift is not from man to God. It is from God to man. It is not our love for God, but it is God's love for us in sending his son to be the way to take away our sins. Uh, the great Oxford theologian John R. Stott said it like this, Christianity is set apart from every other religion in the world. No other system, no other religion proclaims free forgiveness and a new life to those who have done nothing to deserve it and deserve judgment instead but Christianity. John MacArthur says, as far as the way of salvation is concerned, there's only two religions in the world. Only two religions in the world, he says. The religion of divine accomplishment and the religion of human achievement. Which one today are you following? Grace or works? And today we want to look at the right way the grace of God as to how we are made right with God. And I want to read about that grace of God that brings about salvation in Ephesians, the second chapter, beginning at verse four. Listen closely as to how we can find the right way that we are declared righteous, right standing before a holy God. Remember Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, we're not going to read all of them. But listen closely. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in his mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The means of salvation 
And the channel of salvation is given very clearly here. The means is grace and the channel is faith. Let's look at that. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The basis of salvation that we can even think about being saved by a holy God is the grace of God. Harold Holner said in his book, a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, grace means keros, that which bestows pleasure, delight, and favor. It is repeated to assure the reader that his salvation is based on God's grace. God's response to the sinner's plight is one of mercy. The motive for his compassion is his love for them. And the basis of his action is his grace. And that word grace is used over 164 times in the Bible. What does that word mean? It's used so many times in the New Testament. The Bible says that Joseph found grace in his sight, Potiphar's sight, and he served him and he made him overseer over all of his house. You know the story of Joseph. Everywhere he went, he found grace with the people that he served. That word grace, it means unmerited, undeserved favor. In the New Testament, it is necessary to realize the desperate situation of the unregenerate sinner who deserves the wrath of God and then to recognize that grace alone is the only way that they can be given salvation. That word for salvation, S-O-Z-O, -O, so it means to save or to deliver. And what does that mean? The situation is so desperate that only by God's grace can we be delivered. Due to the dilemma of being dead in trespasses and sin, there is no hope of deliverance from God's wrath outside of God's grace. Our situation is so desperate and so horrible and so ungodly before a holy and righteous God that nothing we do can appease the righteousness of God against sin. Nothing we do can appease His righteousness, His, His judgment against sin. The story is told of Henry Morehouse. He was one of the great preachers who went to a Moody Bible Church when D.L. Moody was actually there. He was from England. He was working in a farmhouse and, and one of the farm girls that had gone out and milked some cows and, and she, she brought back a pitcher of milk to put on the nice tech breakfast table and somehow or another she tripped and fell and this beautiful pitcher fell and broke into many pieces and and uh, Henry Morehouse tried to help her clean it up and to uh, clean the pieces of glass, but there were so many pieces they could not glue it back together and it looked right. So the next day he went to town and he bought her a brand new picture and presented it to her. No way to put it all back together. Let me tell you something. There is absolutely no way that God can put together your sinful, awful life and you offer it up to a holy God to enter into the gates of heaven. Your life is broken to pieces. You're beyond help. You're desperate. And you cannot even think of presenting your life with all the evil that you've done in your life and present it to a holy God. That's what the grace of God is all about. He gave her a new pitcher to put that milk in. And the Bible says that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. And, and, and he's made holy before God. That Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He makes us a new creation in Jesus Christ and we are made acceptable. Being accepted in the beloved, we have access to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Your broken down life cannot at any time be brought before a righteous and holy God and be made acceptable by Him. He will not accept it. As a matter of fact, He only accepts 100%, not 50%, not 40%, not 80%, not even ivory soap percentage, 99.9% pure. No, he will not accept that. He only accepts the righteousness of God and we have to be in him, in him at death to be accepted by God. And that's exactly what Chuck Swindoll was saying in his book, Grace Awakening. The instrument of salvation is faith. The means is faith. The foundation or basis is grace, the grace and love of God. But we receive this by faith. Someone defined justification by faith in these terms. Justification is a sovereign act of God whereby he declares righteous the believing sinner while he is still in a sinful or sinning state, he still will justify you before God if you realize the desperation of the evil in your life and you turn, that means repent, if you turn to God and you trust His Son by faith, put your faith in Him, you will be accepted. And many of you here today are putting one foot in the righteousness of God that has no holes in it, in His purity, none what at all. He is 100% holy and righteous. And you have your other foot in that other skiff, which is your righteousness. And you could think that you can, can kind of uh, uh, sturdy up uh, your Christianity by having your foot in Christ and also just in case having your foot in that other boat that has holes in it. And that other boat is going to sink and that's your righteousness. But the righteousness of God will never sink on you. The instrument of salvation is faith. For our grace you say through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Justification, the sovereign act of God, whereby he declares righteous the believing sinner. Have you done that in your life? The third thing that we see today is the mistaking attempts at salvation. The mistaking attempts. The basis is grace. The means is faith. But we also need to look at the mistaking attempts of gaining salvation that we have in our churches in our land today. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of the law, for the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So the first mistaking attempt is some think that they can be justified before a holy God by their good works. And it could be many. Some believe that by living a good moral life, keeping the law, following the golden rule, performing charitable deeds, that they go here and there doing these charitable deeds. And we asked a man not too recently that uh, brought food to our church, and that's good. And we asked him that important question today. If you were to stand before God and he asked you why he should let you into your heaven. And he says, well, I'm a good man and, and I help out when there's a need. And we're in a crisis right now and he brings food and that's great. And he brings canned goods and things and and he actually feels like that's going to get him into heaven. But we've been reading verse after verse after verse that it's only by the grace of God a person is saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. No matter what type of charitable deeds you do, 
You could give out a billion bags of groceries and go to hell. You could be the kindest philanthropist in the world here, especially in this area, supporting this charity and that charity and that hospital and that hospital. You could do all these great things at this time, but none of those things Will God declare you righteous before God? Not one of them. This is a mistaking idea and attempt to get to heaven. Let me read it again. Knowing this, that a man is not justified, declared right by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And an example of this is a man in the 10th chapter of Acts. His name was Cornelius. He was captain over a hundred Roman soldiers. And he lived in Caesarea, and that Caesarea was in Caesarea Maritime. I happened to go there with a group in January of this year. And we visited where Herod had built a beautiful port, and it was called Caesarea Maritime. And Cornelius lived there in that first century. And this is what are some of the things that it said about this Roman soldier, this Roman centurion. It says that he was a devout man in Acts the 10th chapter. Do you know anybody that's devout, totally dedicated to God, committed to God? Not too many devout people out there. He feared God. We don't have much fear of God in our land today. Respect for God and respect for His commandments and respect for the Word of God and the ethics of God. There's not much fear of God. But Cornelius feared God and he taught his family to fear God. But he was lost. He did not know God. It went on to say that he gave alms to the poor. To those in need, most of them would stay around the synagogue waiting for somebody to give them something. And he gave alms to the poor, Cornelius, but he was lost. He prayed to God always and he fasted. He was always a man of prayer. And along with praying, he fasted in his intercession. Do you know anybody that fast? I know very, very few preachers in the Southern Baptist Convention or in our churches that fast, less than probably 5%. But Cornelius prayed and he fasted. That means you're dedicated to praying. But he was lost. He did not know God. He had visions and he had dreams. And one of those visions led to his salvation. He was a just man before others. That means that he treated people right. A whole lot of people in our word don't treat their neighbor and their customers right. This is the man. He saw what was right and he treated people right, but he himself was not right with God. And God gave him a vision he says, as a man that lives south of you in the city of Joppa, his name is Simon Peter, and he lives in the home of one called Simon the Tanner. Uh, you know, he took the skins of animals and, and made them into furniture and many different things. I want you to send some of your servants down there and get him and bring him back up to Caesarea. And he did. And Peter shared the gospel with, with Cornelius that Paul had all of these great qualities, but he had not put his faith in Jesus Christ. And Peter shared what Jesus Christ did. And this man believed in his heart in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and his family believed and they were baptized to declare their faith in Jesus Christ. You're not justified by works of any kind, religion and works will not save you. And President Eisenhower, Ike, as he was known back in the 50s, you remember he was the general who led the Normandy invasion. When he came back, he was good friends with Billy Graham. It was Billy Graham that convinced him to run for president. And they were in his Gettysburg home. It was a farm there in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. 
And I asked him about how a person can know God, his relationship with God. He was concerned about it. Billy Graham shared with him how he had put his faith in God, even though he was a very religious person. I grew up as a religious person. His family was a member of the Brethren Church. They even taught their children Hebrew and Greek so they could to study the Bible in that language. They had to memorize many scriptures, but Ike was not sure of his relationship with God. That's why he invited Graham. Graham shared with him, and Ike prayed to receive Christ as his Savior. Even though he grew up in a very, very strict religious home, he was lost. And Graham prays with him, and he receives Christ. And then he gets elected president, and while he is president, he is the first president that has ever been baptized while in office. He was not ashamed to declare his faith. And not only that, he was one of the first that went to that church, the National Presbyterian Cathedral there in Washington, D.C. He went to New Beginners class, one of the first to ever have done anything like that. What do you hear nowadays about how a person can get into heaven? My, my goodness, how I was brought up in a religious home, baptized as a youth or as a baby. That's what you hear all the time. I'm doing the best I can, preacher. I'm a good person. I keep the commandments. I don't cheat. I don't steal and so forth. And that will not make you a Christian. You remember that it was Martin Luther who went to Rome and he realized that Walking up to Sancta Scala would not save him. And he got down from there and he declared his faith in Christ apart from doing all these religious things to get peace with God. Or perhaps you remember another person, uh, John Newton, the slave trader. And he was carrying slaves from Africa to the Caribbean and then to England. And on one of those trips, oh, John Newton was a mean, rough, tough sailor, slave trader, did all kinds of evil, had a big drinking problem. He was always drunk on those slave ships. One day he fell off and they had to throw a spear at him and he grabbed it and they pulled him back in and saved him. Then they hit a storm and the ship was sinking and it looked like that all of them was going to die before they got back to, to England with those slaves. And, and the captain says, everybody get down and get buckets and carry the buckets up to get this water out of here. And John Newton, drunk, was taking buckets out, lifting them up, taking buckets out. And he was praying. He felt so ashamed of himself. He was not a Christian. He was not a religious person. So he prayed in the name of the God of his mother. And he prayed to the God of his mother, God, save me, save me, have mercy. I'll live for you, God. Forgive me of my sins, save me. And John Newton's life was changed. And he was the one that wrote, of course, amazing grace. We are not saved by works. We are not saved by religious works or religious duties. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. I think old North Carolina evangelist passed on now, Vance Habner, said it best as to what's happening in our churches and in our land. This is what he said. It is possible to get a lot of people busy doing a lot of things Christians ought to do without their being Christians. We got a lot of people doing the things that look like Christians and what Christians ought to do, but they're not even Christians. Paul says in this book in Ephesians that by grace we're saved through faith and not of yourself and that it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5 says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted. His faith is counted for righteousness. And again, Romans 3, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
There is nothing you do, no religious activity or action, no good works that you do. You could be the greatest person ethically in the world and still die and go to hell unless you put your faith in one person, and that is Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said of faith and trust, it means casting yourself upon Christ, resting on His promises, and accepting His finished work on Calvary for your behalf. You have a big decision. The grace of God, which is sufficient and is finished, are the works of the flesh, the religious works of the flesh, that will not ever obtain peace with God and right standing with God. The big choice today, what are you trusting in? Your own goodness, your own religious things, all of your works, you give to the poor, uh, you give uh, volunteer time to, to help delinquent children. I've done all that, but I don't do it to get saved. Or do you trust in the mercy and grace of God? Now this morning, we're going to give you the opportunity to make the choice. I want you to make it right here where you sit this morning. And many of you are watching by TV. We want you to make it on TV. This is your chance. You may not have another chance. But God in His sovereignty has you watching this program today. Now you have the choice. What are you trusting in? It for your goodness, your righteousness, which is, by the way, the Bible says, filthy rags. Or are you trusting in the perfect life, perfect work of Christ, His life, His perfect death on the cross for your sins, and His resurrection, and now He lives in heaven. And today we give you the opportunity right now. I want you to bow your heads wherever you're at. And I want you to pray this prayer. You have to pray it sincerely. You have to mean it. I can lead you, but you have to mean it. This has to be your prayer. Pray it with me. Dear God, I know without a doubt that I have sinned and I have fallen way short of what you want me to be. If I'm honest with you, God, I have fallen way short of what you want me to be and I repent of my sins, and I turn to Jesus Christ as my only answer today. And dear God, right now, as best as I can, I place my trust in you, Jesus Christ, as my, as my Savior and Lord. I want you to come into my heart and live and give me this peace with God when I put my faith in Christ. Give me peace with God. I trust Christ alone for my Savior and to be my Lord in life. Thank you for doing this because I know it to be your will. Thank you for saving my soul. I ask in Jesus' name. Today you have heard about the greatest decision that you'll ever make in life, grace or works, as to your standing before a holy God. Some of you prayed and made a decision to trust Christ as your personal Savior. Truly, we want to hear from you. Call us at the number on the screen and we're going to tell you what that next big step that you need to make. And join us this coming Sunday in worship. <music>